Hello, literary genres, drama students, and welcome. Uh, today I'm going to be speaking to you about the play Oedipus Tyrannus by Sophocles. Um, we've been speaking about the play for the last couple class periods. Today I'd like to, now, now that you've uh, read some of the play, I would like to begin to wade into the discussion with a little more uh, directness. Uh, as we've mentioned previously, tragic drama for the uh, ancient Attic civilization in Greece uh, in around the 5th century before the Common Era was typically associated with a series of religious rituals uh, and festivals dedicated to the god Dionysus. And most of the extant tragedies that we have from this culture uh, were the products of a dramatic competition associated with this festival. Typically, the plays were produced in groups of three. You had a tragic trilogy, and then you also had a satyr play that was somewhat bawdy, somewhat comic. Uh, the, the tragic trilogies, however, typically uh, worked on a, a cumulative theme. Some of the most famous ones uh, include uh, the Oresteia, uh, related to Agamemnon and his family, uh, and what we are working with, the Theban cycle which is the story of Oedipus and his kin. Uh, Oedipus Tyrannus is the first of the three plays. Uh, and in this play, the character of Oedipus uh, is obviously central. He's the eponymous figure, the title of the play. Uh, and so his uh, struggle to come to understand his situation is the basic focus of the play. The second play in the sequence, Oedipus at Colonus, consists of the struggles of his family, in particular, two of his children, um, Eteocles and Polynices, his two sons, who end up fighting for the throne. Uh, they're kind of taking turns being the leaders of Thebes and uh, end up in, involved in what becomes a civil war. And both of them end up dying in this battle. Uh, and then the third play is entitled Antigone, uh, Antigone is one of Oedipus's daughters. Uh, you're probably aware by the time we get to the end of the play, Antigone and Ismene are two characters who appear in the Oedipus Tyrannus, and they are two of the main protagonists, uh, along with Creon, who is also obviously a very prominent figure in Oedipus Tyrannus. Uh, the three of them are the main uh, characters in Antigone. And Antigone, we have a conflict uh, between Antigone, the daughter of Oedipus, and her obligations, her familial obligations to the gods, and basically her desire to bury her, uh, her brother, Polynices, who has been treated as a traitor by the uh, Theban state, and uh, respecting the laws of the state, in particular the dictate of Creon, who has decreed that uh, one cannot bury Polynices because precisely he is uh, a traitor. So as I mentioned, uh, these plays would be performed in the festival of Dionysus. Uh, typically it's believed by many scholars that they were actually only performed once. Uh, and so we have, uh, you know, a, a kind of a very haphazard record of the history of these plays. And certainly among Greek tragedies, it's true that we know of the existence of many, many tragedies but we have, you know, probably 30 plus uh, extant tragedies that we actually have, some of them in fragmentary form. Um, and so this particular play, Oedipus Tyrannus, is perhaps uh, justly known as the greatest of Greek tragedies. Um, it's the greatest tragedy written by the greatest tragedian, Sophocles, uh, during the greatest era of tragic drama, the, the heyday, the golden age of Athenian tragedy. Um, We've mentioned previously the th theoretical backdrop. Um, Aristotle, in his critical work, The Poetics, mentions Oedipus Tyrannus nine times, uh, which he mentions any other tragedies that he mentions. He never mentions any other one more than once. So Oedipus Tyrannus clearly takes uh, focus from him. The character of Oedipus has been uh, the subject of tragic plays 
throughout history. Um, we have uh, French versions by Corneille, Voltaire. We have an English version by John Dryden. We have a Latin version by Seneca, uh, a later French version by André Gide, uh, not to mention clearly uh, versions by the other classical tragedians, uh, Aeschylus and Euripides, which have been lost to us. Um, but by far uh, the most famous, the most renowned version is uh, Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannus. Uh, and then, of course, we don't even probably need to mention the fact that the play's um, sort of broader resonance is exacerbated, is made more broad uh, by uh, the theories of Sigmund Freud and Sigmund Freud uh, with his theory of the Oedipus complex. Uh, sort of a, a theory of psychosexual development. Um, interestingly, he uses two uh, famous tragedies, Sophocles' Oedipus Tyrannus and uh, Shakespeare's Hamlet as the basis of his theory and uh, the idea that uh, a young boy will grow to love his mother uh, and want to replace his father. And of course, you know, people have uh, various reactions to Freud's theories. Uh, some people feel that he's overly, uh, he overemphasizes uh, the role of sexuality and, and sexual desire in uh, theorizing how human beings exist. Uh, other people feel that there's perhaps a, a fair bit of a validity to some of the things he said. You're entirely uh, entitled to take those theories and their relevance with whatever grain of salt you may want to, or uh, give them whatever precedence you want to. But clearly, um, the fact that Freud wrote so extensively about Oedipus, and interestingly, Freud, uh, Freud uses a lot of literature as his kind of touchstone when he writes his theories. He uses other Shakespeare plays as well, The Merchant of Venice, um, and there's all kinds of uh, broader resonance where literary figures uh, come to represent uh, an important place in our understanding of uh, how we relate to one another as human beings. As I've said previously, um, a lot of people feel that literature is the sort of the foundational uh, place where we make uh, metaphysical discoveries about ourselves precisely because it gives us sort of a broader palette to work with. So that's a little bit of backdrop on the play. Um, as I said, as you wade into the play, probably some of your reading uh, has been possibly difficult uh, for a number of reasons. I'm, you know, we'll probably talk to you in class about this uh, a couple times, but certainly some of the choral odes become very, very dense. There's kind of a, the, the interaction of characters, the, the role of the chorus and other things uh, all can conspire to make the play slightly difficult for students. Obviously the cultural context of the play, the fact that it was uh, originally produced 2,500 years ago and that it relates to elements of, you know, classical Greek culture, make it very, very far from the things that we're used to. And certainly the drama doesn't make much of an effort at realism, okay? And that's probably important to be aware of that the drama is being portrayed uh, in a much more overtly symbolic way. And what we're looking for in this play, uh, we might not see necessarily at the surface level very easily. And so as we uh, delve into Sophocles' treatment of the character of Oedipus and his relevance to us, uh, we enter a realm that's uh, very, very rich, tragic drama. Uh, as I've mentioned previously in class, the, the tales typically take their subject matter uh, from the deep past, what we might refer to as the heroic age uh, period in the ancient Mycenaean civilization from around 1600 before the common era to you know the 11th or 12th century uh, before the common era. And you have all these stories obviously <clears throat> uh, revolving around the heroic uh, enterprises of the, the venture to Troy uh, that the Achaeans undertook to bring back Helen uh, and many of these figures, Agamemnon, Achilles, um, Odysseus, and Oedipus among them, um, <clears throat> are drawn from those, uh, from those stories, the, ep the epic poetic stories. And as we've mentioned previously, uh, these served as the starting point for many of the tragedians to uh, embark on their own stories. And certainly the tragedies um, 
the tragedies will sort of build on these, obviously <clears throat> with a slightly different focus. Um, we do have heroic behavior, but it's heroic behavior with uh, a very decidedly uh, somber twist to it, right? Um, in the Agamemnon, uh, Zeus famously speaks about uh, pathematos, which is learning by suffering. And that's probably one of the central dictates of tragic drama, that we somehow take something. We talked about this in class last week, um, how these stories can edify us, can sort of sustain us with some kind of vicarious understanding of the operation of the universe. So in the story of Oedipus, uh, we have what appears to be uh, a great king, Oedipus the Tyrannos, and obviously uh, Tyrannos has uh, an interesting etymological background to it. Uh, we could see the connections to our contemporary word tyrant. However, a Tyrannos is typically um, a king who does not have a hereditary lineage. He's not the king because he inherits the kingship from his father, uh, but he has some uh, moral stake to the to the claim. In other words, he does something. It's because of his actions. Now, of course, uh, a tyrant is someone whose actions include uh, perhaps usurping the throne or using power um, in an abusive way. But the tyrannos is typically not seen necessarily as a negative person. And obviously, Oedipus, um, at the beginning of the play, certainly appears to be uh, very empathetic, uh, very aware of what's going on in Thebes. So uh, I'd like to spend a little bit of time here and just set the stage. As I said, <clears throat> you've read through uh, much of the play by now, and we've uh, discussed certain aspects of it, but I'd like to just sort of clarify certain things. So in the beginning of the play, um, Oedipus comes out on the stage and he sees uh, a great deal of suffering among the polis, the people of the polis, so the city-state. And we get a very strong sense of his, uh, his sense of obligation, right? Oedipus is, and, and I think what's very important in these first scenes of the play is that Oedipus is presented to us as a good ruler, uh, a person who is very concerned with the well-being of the people around him, well-being of his uh, subjects, and seeing their suffering, as he mentions, um, their suffering is much, much less than his, because he suffers for himself, uh, for the polis, and for them, right? So he feels uh, triply burdened, perhaps. And of course, uh, many of the things that play out in the as the play progresses uh, suggest kind of the the, the depth of the emotional weight that he feels from this. So at the onset of the play, uh, Oedipus and the people of Thebes are awaiting the return of Creon. Creon is Oedipus's brother-in-law. Uh, he is Jocasta, Oedipus's wife's brother. And he is a very important figure in all three of these plays. And Creon is kind of a polemic figure who also presents uh, an interesting contrast to the character of Oedipus, uh, because Oedipus is kind of, uh, he's an impulsive actor, so he takes steps, he makes decisions based on what he feels, and he acts accordingly. Creon is kind of the consummate politician. Um, he's much more deliberative. He waits, he thinks, he weighs decisions before he sort of takes an action. He's much more, um, he's much slower and much more careful. Whereas Oedipus, as I said, might be impetuous. He acts uh, very abruptly. He sees what he thinks is the right action and he takes it. He doesn't really hesitate. And so we see that immediately in the beginning of the play when Creon, uh, Creon has been sent to the Oracle at Delphi uh, and one of the key things with this play uh, has to do with the role of prophecy and oracles. Obviously, for the Greeks, this was an important issue. Um, their polytheistic faith, their sense of uh, their place in the universe, had a great deal of reliance on 
sort of interpreting messages from the gods. And sometimes there are people who are uh, more uh, effectively positioned to do that. So you have auguries and you have oracles and you have prophets and you have people who can um, interpret signs, whether it's, uh, you know, the messages of the gods. Sometimes they would be playing with the entrails of animals that were being sacrificed. There's all kinds of auspicious omens. Um, and so people were specialized to do that. And the society places a great deal of importance on that, on that ability. Um, and so initially, Creon has been sent to the Oracle at Delphi. Interestingly, for a number of reasons, the Oracle at Delphi is very, very, the most important um, Oracle in Greek culture of this time. Um, the inscription above the entry at the Oracle at Delphi is, Know Thyself. Um, and so there's a, the, the fundamental theme of self-knowledge uh, enters into the picture in this play very, very early on. Um, and we'll see that these oracles have sort of uh, multiplied. They've doubled themselves up. We see a number of different uh, references to oracle and prophecy here. So Creon is coming back um, from Delphi, and they're anxiously awaiting him. And of course, one of the key things with the drama is that the action uh, because dramatic portrayal is typically limited to dialogue, uh, we don't have a whole lot of narrative explanation. And so very often uh, the, the, the role of narrative explanation, which we do need, we do need to have some uh, sort of uh, guide to what's happening, uh, is often occurs in the form of dialogue. And so Oedipus is talking to uh, the people of Thebes, telling them what's going on, um, and there's kind of this back and forth that lets us know that uh, Creon has left for the Oracle of Delphi. They're anxiously awaiting his return. And of course, he very shortly um, shows up. They see him coming and they're anxious to, uh, to hear what he has to say. And so with, with Creon's approach, um, we anxiously await with Oedipus, with the priests uh, and the people of Thebes, um, his response. Oedipus has sent Creon to the Oracle at Delphi because there is a miasma, there is a, a great plague, a suffering um, afflicting the people of Thebes, uh, and Oedipus has been proactive. He is trying to do something that will um, address the problem. And so he sent Creon, uh, which is obviously a sign of his confidence in Creon. This is a very, uh, this is a very important, noteworthy mission. Uh, and so the fact that he entrusts it to someone like Creon suggests that there's a great deal of trust, obviously. Um, the fact that Creon is his wife's brother suggests that there would be uh, some logical basis for that. And as Creon approaches, uh, Oedipus tells us, right, that what's going to happen. The priest asks um, what you know, what is going to happen. Um, and, and Oedipus replies, we will soon know he is in range of hearing. Creon approaches. Lord, my relation, child of Menoetheus, what news have you brought us from the god? And Creon responds, good news. I tell you that even troubles hard to bear will end in perfect peace if they find the right issue. And Oedipus replies, what kind of answer, Epos, was there? So far your words make me neither bold nor fearful. And Creon responds, if you want to hear in the presence of these people, I am ready to speak. Otherwise, we can go inside. Um, and here you have immediately um, a quick sense of <clears throat> the contrast between Oedipus and Creon. Um, now, Creon's been kind of cryptic, right? When Oedipus asks him, uh, you know, what news have you brought us from the God? We're all anxiously awaiting this, right? There's all these people suffering. There's people dying. The crops are not flourishing. Uh, women are not conceiving. They're not giving birth animals. Um, so there's kind of this natural uh, scourge, right? The society is in a, is in a state of uh, suspended animation, and it's very bad. And so the, the, the level of anticipation is very, very high. And Creon seems to be speaking in kind of almost oxymoronic tone. Um, Even troubles hard to bear will end in perfect peace if they find the right issue. So in other words, everything will work out fine if everything works out fine. 
um, which is sort of ridiculous. Um, and then when Oedipus pushes him a little more, he says, well, if you want to speak, uh, if you want me to speak in front of all these people, I'm happy to do it, but otherwise we can go inside. And clearly Creon's preference is not to share the information that he has um, taken back from the Oracle in with the broader public. Um, this is kind of selective, uh, strategic, let's say, political behavior, um, whereas Oedipus is feeling none, none of what Creon is speaking of here. Um, speak to all. The sorrow, penthos that I bear for these is more than for my own life. Um, and so, of course, this is a very important moment in the play because precisely everything that results from Creon's, uh, the information that Creon shares is public knowledge, as opposed to the possibility that if, uh, if Oedipus had chosen to maintain the information uh, just between him and Creon, they may have been able to uh, respond to it and react to it in a slightly different way. So this kind of puts everything forward. And of course, Oed we, we see very much from Oedipus that Oedipus doesn't want to be perceived by the public as someone who's holding back, who's hiding, right? Um, the nature of sort of political responsibility and the nature of, of moral, ethical responsibility is certainly one of the key issues uh, in play in this, in this work. And uh, one of the reasons, you know, as we've said previously, the Festival of Dionysus as a religious festival and a very sort of important high profile public uh, gathering would have been a moment for people to really uh, think a lot about some of these uh, issues. And so um, with Creon's return, uh, we quickly understand the nature of the problem confronting the polis. Oedipus has spoken of a defilement, a miasma uh, that is uh, afflicting them. And with Creon's return, we understand the root cause. Uh, what has happened is that the previous king of Thebes, Laos, was murdered under questionable circumstances uh, many, many years ago. And Oedipus speaks about this. Uh, he did not know Laos. He, he's unaware of what happened to Laos. But when Creon returns, he has the message of Phoebus Apollo, the oracle at Delphi, that the reason why the curse has been put on the polis of Thebes has to do with the fact that Laos's murderer is somewhere in their midst. So the people of Thebes are protecting a murderer, and this uh, moral outrage has angered the gods. And so until this injustice is addressed, uh, the city will continue to suffer. And so, of course, Oedipus uh, immediately enters and starts to pose questions. We start to see uh, the type of person that Oedipus is. We've seen him, he's proactive, sending Creon to the Oracle uh, even before the, the drama begins. And now we start to see him in response. So he becomes aware that Laos' murder um, is the root of the problem. And he immediately proposes possible punishments, either the death of the murderer or the exile, um, as a way to expiate this sin. And he seems to be taking a uh, sort of central place He's uh, very much believes himself up to the task of saving the city of Thebes. And of course, we know the reason for this, one of the reasons uh, why he has such a, a high level of self-confidence has to do with the fact that previously, um, before the action of the play began, uh, Oedipus famously saved the city of Thebes before, um, many, many years ago, there was an affliction, uh, the, the Sphinx. The Sphinx, which is a creature, a mythical creature, uh, in some guises half uh, lion, half human, some half bird, uh, but it's this mythical creature that uh, afflicts the city of Thebes. And in the case of the play, um, what was happening was on the road entering Thebes, travelers were confronted by the Sphinx and they had to answer a riddle. Uh, what is the creature that walks in on four legs in the morning, 
on two legs in the afternoon and on three legs in the evening. And if they were unable to correctly answer this riddle, then they were devoured by the Sphinx. Uh, and the answer to the riddle is man. Uh, human beings, when they were born, when they're babies, they walk on four legs. In other words, they crawl on all fours. Um, as we grow up, we become upright and bipedal. We walk on two legs in the afternoon. And as we age and become more feeble, uh, we often rely on the assistance of a cane in order to locomote. And so we walk on three legs in the evening. And so the correct answer to the riddle is man. And Oedipus is the one who solves this riddle and uh, makes the Sphinx disappear uh, and solves the problems of the, the people of Thebes. He arrives in the city as a hero uh, and he is presented to Jocasta, the queen who has recently been widowed, has lost her husband, Laos, um, and they quickly marry and have uh, many children. Now, of course, in the context of what we are presented with, with Creon's uh, statement of what the gods want and Oedipus's sort of uh, exuberant response. Oedipus is the go-to guy. He's the one who believes that he can save uh, the people of the polis. And as I said, he proposes perhaps either uh, the death or the exile of the guilty party in order to uh, save the city of Thebes. And we quickly find out that uh, in order to learn what the root of the problem is, in other words, we know that Laos's murderer is the culprit, but we don't know much more. And as I said, Oedipus says uh, that, you know, the, the murder of Laos occurred before he was in the city of Thebes. So he doesn't know really that much about Laos. He doesn't know that much about the circumstances of the murder, but he immediately sets out to find, find as much information as he can. Um, and we do see the personality of Oedipus taking charge, uh, central, you know, bearing the burden of the responsibility on himself. As I said, we contrasted him with Creon previously. Uh, Creon is hesitant, tentative, uh, he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to be the public face necessarily because there might be things to be gained, but there's obviously risks. Uh, it's a risk and reward scenario. And, you know, you take the risk, but, uh, you know, you, you, you seek the reward, but by seeking the reward and putting yourself forward, you obviously uh, present yourself as vulnerable and possibly uh, the one who will uh, pay a certain price. We quickly come to here that the oracles have suggested the way forward is to consult the blind seer Tiresias. And so this is the course of action that is undertaken. Uh, Tiresias is a very famous figure in Greek mythology. Um, he's the one person who has in the past been converted into a woman. He's a man and he was a woman at one point and was a man. Um, and there's a discussion at one point in one of the mythological works, it might be Hesiod's works and days, um, where I believe uh, Zeus and Hera even are having a conversation uh, about who has more pleasure in the sexual act, whether it's men or women. Uh, and because Tiresias is the only uh, person who has been both a man and a woman, uh, they ask him and he says that if sexual pleasure were divided in ten, nine parts of the ten are the pleasure of the woman, and the man has only one. So apparently, according to Tiresias, uh, women have much more pleasure in sex than men do. Um, that's Tiresias talking. I'm not going to enter wade into that discussion very much, but um, obviously this is one element of Tiresias's personality. He's a character who comes up uh, repeatedly. He has a, a, an important role to play. So he's a blind seer, um, which is kind of oxymoronic. Blind, in other words, his physical uh, capacity to see is not there. Um, but he's a seer, in other words, a person able to uh, read the future, predict things. And so he is brought forward 
uh, to speak with Oedipus. And this confrontation starts to be uh, a turning point in the drama because we immediately see when Tiresias is brought forward, he's brought forward with a young boy. Um, he's an unwilling participant. Um, he's been asked to come to bring his knowledge and wisdom uh, to the aid of the polis. And he, as he comes forward, he clearly does not wish to be there. And this interaction between Tiresias and Oedipus is rather volatile. Uh, Oedipus is asking Tiresias uh, a number of questions related to uh, what he knows. And Tiresias is extremely hesitant uh, to provide the information that Oedipus is asking for. And of course, Oedipus uh, has a very particular interpretation of what's going on, okay? Due to the fact that it was Creon who brought back the recommendation from the oracle, first, that the murder of Laos is the cause of the suffering, and second, that in order to find out more uh, about the situation, uh, they should consult with the blind seer Tiresias, um, Oedipus becomes slightly suspicious um, and questionable about the uh, what's going on with Tiresias, and by extension, uh, Creon, because Tiresias is really trying to avoid answering his questions, and he asks him what he knows and how he knows it, um, and Tiresias sort of uh, avoids the point. Um, and so when, uh, when Oedipus starts to react to this, Oedipus's interpretation of Tiresias's hesitancy is that he's hiding something. He's hiding information that he knows. And the only possible interpretation, according to Oedipus, is that this must mean that there's some level of complicity and guilt on his part. Now, of course, Tiresias is hiding something, uh, but his motivations are not necessarily what Oedipus interprets them to be. Tiresias does know who the murderer is, but he does not want to tell Oedipus um, precisely because he fears uh, the consequence of perhaps revealing what he knows. And so uh, the interaction between these two men goes uh, badly awry, um, and Oedipus is extremely uh, caustic and harsh with Tiresias. Now, of course, the, the problem um, in Oedipus's meeting with Tiresias is precisely a lack of mutual understanding. Um, Oedipus is interpreting Tiresias's resistance in a certain way, and he becomes furious. Um, he becomes extremely anger, angry um, and quite uh, deprecating and very insulting to Tiresias. And in fact, he ends up uh, kind of mocking his blindness, which is not a very um, not a very noble thing to do, and probably maybe one of the first instances in the play where we see uh, Oedipus in a in a pointedly negative light. Um, I think his behavior here is uh, dubious, questionable, um, and so. Of course, Tiresias hesitates and hesitates and hesitates. Oedipus pushes and pushes and pushes. Uh, they are really two very stubborn, uh, you know, intransigent people butting heads. And finally, um, after Oedipus just continues to insult him and, and disparage him, Tiresias says, fine, if you really want to know, you're the one who killed Laius. Um, and we become aware that the reason that Tiresias was withholding this information is because Oedipus is the king, the Tyrannos, um, and he really doesn't want to face the possible uh, repercussions of that type of uh, revelation. Oedipus is completely, goes ballistic. Um, he can't imagine why Tiresias would be saying this. He knows that he's not the one who killed Laius. Um, he doesn't even know who Laius was. Uh, 
and so he starts constructing in his head uh, a series of rationalizations as to why uh, Tiresias has done what he's done. Obviously, um, if the gods have directed Oedipus to seek Tiresias's help, something's amiss here. He goes back to the fact that Creon was the one who transmitted the message from the oracle at Delphi to him, um, suggesting that Tiresias is the one. And so he immediately imagines that uh, the fault lies with Creon. Creon is his brother-in-law, as I said previously, um, Jocasta's brother. And Oedipus has seemed to have a cordial and a respectful relationship with him. However, uh, after Tiresias reveals what he reveals, uh, Oedipus can only imagine that it is Creon uh, seeking this out. And so his, his idea is that Creon seeks uh, Oedipus's throne and that he has paid off Tiresias in order to say these things. And the two of them are in cahoots to try to uh, undermine Oedipus's power and ultimately to usurp his throne. Uh, when Oedipus goes to confront Creon, uh, this becomes, Creon's shocked, first off. Um, again, it's his brother-in-law, so they have a familial relationship. One of the key things uh, in most of Greek tragedy, almost 90% of the extant tragedies, uh, turn on familial relationships. And one of the things, uh, for example, Hegel uh, speaks about is precisely those issues of familial ties because familial ties are not like friendship ties, right? When you have a, when you have a family connection to someone, um, it's, you don't have the same level of freedom. I mean, you can break with a family member certainly, but people are a bit more hesitant to do that. And you were probably ready to give, um, ready to give a little more, uh, leeway to someone who is a family member precisely because they are a family member. And so those, conflicting um, obligations that we have to our family members create uh, a lot of the backdrop, the, the moral, complex moral backdrop to tragedy, because we have consistent ties that we need to honor to these people, but we have other uh, moral obligations as well. And sometimes um, that's precisely where the tragic conflict comes into play. And so in this particular play, um, very much of this turns on family relationships, perhaps more so than any other um, tragedy. So when uh, Oedipus confronts Creon, says, you know, I know what you did. You went to the Oracle at Delphi, you came back and you were in cahoots with Tiresias. You two are trying to take my throne. Um, Creon's response is, is just, well, this is crazy. Why would I want the throne? Um, because I have all of the advantages of the throne. I am Jocasta's brother. I'm your brother-in-law. I get all the benefit of power, of proximity to power. You're the, you're the Tyrannos. I'm right near you. I can, you know, I can take advantage of uh, your status, but I don't have any of the obligations. I don't have any of the responsibilities, you know, and so, and you, again, you see the, the contrast of the two personalities where Creon has been, uh, you know, keeping at arm's length the necessity for obligations. Um, and so his argument to Oedipus is that that would be foolish of me. Why would I, why would I want the throne when, you know, you have, you have all the power of the throne, but you also have all the headache of the throne. And certainly um, in this particular instance with the defilement of the polis, uh, Oedipus is front and center. And again, he will have the glory of solving the problem if the problem gets solved, uh, but he will also have the burden of solving the problem. And so uh, it's not a given to say that everything is going to work out perfectly for him. Perhaps it will, perhaps it won't. Um, and so Creon's defense is that, you know, this is, this doesn't, this is illogical. Um, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, now Oedipus is not necessarily convinced. Uh, and of course he has the other complicated situation uh, that Creon is as I've said, um, his wife's brother. And so once again, you can't just break because you're still going to have your connection to your wife and your wife is going to have the connection to her brother. So we have a sort of a, sort of a, a problematic situation here. And of course, Jocasta, um, comes to intervene 
these are two people who are both very close to her, that she uh, doesn't like to see them having this uh, discussion, this fight. And so uh, she comes to try to perhaps bring some added uh, clarity and perhaps some possibility of resolution to the problem. And of course, uh, what starts to happen is since they are uh, looking at finding Laos's killer, and since Tiresias has raised the prospect that, according to Oedipus, Creon has reiterated uh, that Oedipus may in fact be the person who killed uh, Laos, now <clears throat> we enter into sort of a, you know, literary history's first crime drama, basically, uh, where we're looking back to see if we can solve the murder of King Laos. And of course, um, from Oedipus' perspective, we now shift from uh, a goal not only of solving the murder and liberating uh, the polis of Thebes from this miasma, but also um, cleansing his good name, right? And sort of proving that he is not, in fact, the one who did this. And so we start with this very laborious process uh, that will continue um, in, our, in our further discussions of the play uh, of trying to reconstruct what happened with Laos. And we do know a number of things. Uh, and as time goes by, we will start to gradually piece uh, little elements of the story together. So we know that Laos uh, was killed on the road at the place where the three roads meet. Um, and so there's a crossroads that uh, happens. And apparently in this place, uh, Laos was confronted by a band of thieves and they uh, attacked his uh, entourage and the people that were traveling with him and they murdered them and they murdered Laos. Uh, and one of the people in uh, Laos's group, his traveling guards, uh, had escaped. And so that's one of the, one of the details that we know. Now, um, Oedipus is starting to have a whole bunch of self-doubt for a number of reasons. Um, and of course, the fact that Tiresias has uh, claimed that he is the murderer means, you know, it's one of, one of the things about being accused of something is that even if you didn't do it, um, there's a stigma attached to that, right? If you, if you, if somebody says you did something, um, there's, there's already a, a stain on your name. And so it's kind of important to be able to, uh, go beyond that, to get rid of that. And so Oedipus is, is desiring that, but he really can't imagine, um, you know, why, why these people are, are trying to do this, why they're trying to, uh, you know, sully his good name. And especially because he has been such a good ruler. Um, and as the story progresses in our next lectures uh, that we'll see on the play, uh, we're going to start to see the, the latter phases of the play and how the various, uh, various people who were involved in the early phases of Oedipus's life uh, come to uh, fill in little gaps in our knowledge. And so um, this will end our lecture for today's uh, class period. I now will invite you to go uh, among the documents and there are a series of questions that I would like you to uh, provide answers for. You do not have to turn these questions in. Uh, you do not need to submit them but I would like you to answer them and be prepared uh, to answer them uh, for next week's class. Uh, so that is all for today. I wish you all uh, a good afternoon.